Holy Spirit, we just thank you for what you're doing tonight. We just, we pray, God, for your spirit just to hover over this night like you brooded over the earth in Genesis 1 and you began to take chaos and make something beautiful. And we pray that you would take any place where there's chaos in our lives and that you would make something beautiful out of it. If you have a place of intense chaos, would you just stand up right now? I've never done this before, but stand up right now. You have a place that you need the Holy Spirit to take your chaos and make it beautiful. It might be a relationship. It might be finance. It might be health thing, whatever. I, I don't know. I don't want to keep saying what it could be because whatever it is, you have a place of chaos and you're like, I need the Holy Spirit to hover over my, you know, my chaos and make it beautiful. If you're watching, um, if you're watching by YouTube or Bethel TV, you can just stand up. If you're driving, just open your sunroof. <laughs> and uh, I'm just going to pray right now for you. I feel it's a Holy Spirit moment right now. I just don't want to miss this moment. Is I... You know, uh, you know the Lord, he takes crap and he uses it to fertilize your destiny. <laughs> There's probably a better way to say that. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I just bless right now. I bless your chaos right now. I pray that God, I pray specifically for the Holy Spirit to hover over the thing in your life that you stood for. And you said, this is chaos. This is crazy. I can't fix this. I pray for Holy Spirit to hover over your chaos right now and to make it wonderful and beautiful. In fact, I, my prayer is that 30 days from now, you'd look back at your chaos and it'd be the most beautiful thing you have going on. I pray for that right now. I pray for that by people who are our, our family that's watching on uh, streaming. Lord, we just release that over them too, that you would take beauty. Do you know that the Lord uses ashes to make beauty? He doesn't use nothing. He makes, he makes beauty from ashes. He takes mourning and he makes joy out of it. Lord, we just release the great exchange right now. Lord, I thank you for the great exchange that's salvation. You took our sin and you gave us life. You took our death and, you, and you, you, you took that on and you made it life. But Lord, you want to do more than salvation. We, or maybe we should say salvation is more than I got into the kingdom. Lord, I just pray in Jesus' name for that. Amen. You can go ahead and sit down. You know, um, I have a message. I want to talk about the power of faith. Um, I, but I have something else going on as I'm standing here as we're praying. You know, Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for good. For those who love God and are called according to his purposes. All things work together. All things. Everybody say things. I want you to say out loud, My things work together for good. Because I love God. And I'm called according to his purpose. And I, uh, the next verse says, for whom he foreknew, he predestined, and whom he predestined, he called, and whom he called, he justified, and whom he justified, he glorified. So I'm pointing out that whom he foreknew, he predestined. You say, God made me choose him. No, he didn't. He knew you would choose him, so he chose you first. How did he know that? Because he doesn't live in time, he lives in eternity. And in this world, how many know, the God, God, in, in God's world, this has already happened. He said that he chose you in him. He chose me in him from the foundation of the world. How many know he chose you from the foundation of the world? You were chosen him, Ephesians 1, you were chosen in him from the foundation of the world. How did God, in other words, before God created the world, he already chose you. How could he choose me and, I'm, and me still have a free will? Because God doesn't live in time. God lives outside of time. Time's a big train passing through God's kingdom. The engine being the beginning of time, it's a metaphor, and the, and the caboose being the end of time. Are, are you following me? And what I'm getting at is that God lives outside of time. 
Jeremiah 1. Um, Jeremiah 1. Jeremiah's telling God he doesn't want to be a prophet. In fact, he says, I, I, I can't be a prophet. I'm not good at this. And God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were conceived, I called you to be a prophet to the nations. God's like, how could you not be equipped to be a prophet? Before you, were con- before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. And people have these ideas that we were like spirits with God before we put in our body. There's no scripture for that. What there is scripture for is that God lives outside of time. And by the way, God is not in heaven. Heaven is in God. Well, how do you know that? Because Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away. So we know that heaven and earth are not eternal. But God's eternal. What does that have to do with it? Well, if God's eternal but heaven's not, it means that there was a time when there was no heaven and there's still God. So where did God live before there was a heaven? My point is, when you get to heaven, God will be there, not because God's in heaven, but because heaven's in God. God's bigger than heaven. (laughs) Are you with me? Um, What I'm getting at is, like, for example, I got saved in June of 1973. But the Lord said that he chose me in him before the foundation world. In fact, Uh, Revelation says that Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. In other words, before Adam had a problem, Jesus, God already had an answer. You were like, oh, I surprised God. (laughs) It's impossible to surprise God. Why? This is a rerun to him. How How does God know the future? He's already been there. Not only is time a create, you know, in Genesis chapter one, it says that, Um, something powerful, you should read the chapter. (laughs) It says that God created, I'm sorry, that God said, let there be light. And then he separated the light from the darkness and he called it a day. Do you know it's three more verses before God creates the sun and the moon? I'd propose that when God created light and separated the light from darkness and called it a day, that God was inventing time, that time's an invention. (laughs) Okay. How could Jesus be crucified from the foundation of the world? Because God doesn't live in time. So in, I got saved in 1973 in June of 73. So let me just give you an example. If, you, if I believe in sovereignty, then it means I, don't, I didn't choose God. He chose me. If I believe in free will, it means that God didn't have a choice. But I'd propose that both is true because before God created the world, he went to the, he went to the train car that said 1973, before he created the world, the time train car. And he saw a broken man who's 18 years old that said, I received Jesus. And God said, whom he foreknew, he predestined. Whom he foreknew, he predestined. God goes, I knew you'd choose me, so I choose you first. He didn't make me choose him, but he knew I'd choose him. How did he know that? Because it already happened in his world. I have a free will. I chose God freely. But he chose me first. How did he do that? Because he knew I'd choose him, so he chose me first. Whom he foreknew, he predestined. What I'm getting at is this is that your, your life is so predestined for glory. Remember whom he foreknew, he predestined, who he predestined, he called, whom he called, he justified, and whom he justified, he what? He glorified. In other words, before the foundation of the world, he already predestined you for glory. That's why everything works together for good, which is the previous verse. Now, some of you have to live a long time. <laughs> it's so funny. Anyway... Um, I'm sorry, I'm I'm not on my notes at all. We may not get there, but I just feel to say that all things work together for good. Like all your things work together for good. How many know if it's not good, everything works together for good in the end, so if it's not good, it ain't the end. There's somebody in here, you have a daughter who's like, she's, she's on drugs and she's living in the street and yet there was a prophecy over her when she was born. I don't know who that is in here. But 
you're, you're, you're worried about her. And I, I, I wouldn't worry about her because this is not the last chapter in the book. She's working on her testimony. And this will be her ministry. She will go back to the place where she was broken and she will call many out of the cesspool of brokenness and drugs and lead them into a place of restoration. That's a good word. I'll tell you the story. I've shared it uh, recently, so you may have heard it, but you know, um, you know I'm here, right? <laughs> In front of y'all. And uh, when I was, uh, when Kathy and I got married, I, uh, you know, I met Kathy when she was 12. I know you know the story. We got engaged when she was 13. It's a true story. We got, engaged, she got, we got married when she was 17. Um, she had to graduate early from high school because her parents said, you have to finish high school. So she graduated in three years. And I was 20 and she was 17. And we were married, uh, we got married. And then a year and a half later, I had a nervous breakdown that lasted three and a half years. And it was really bad. And I, uh, we moved, we had, um, when we were on our honeymoon, we had went to a little place called Lewiston, which is 10, 15 minutes from Weaverville. Um, we went there fishing because our boss that we worked for knew someone there. So we went there fishing. And then when I had a nervous breakdown, we lived in the Bay Area, lived in San Jose. And everything was so, you know, fast paced. And uh, I was about a year and a half in my nervous breakdown. And I, I, I worked every day, but I had probably 20 panic attacks, panic attacks a day. I didn't sleep for three and a half years, more than an hour a night, and I couldn't keep food in me. It was really, really bad. And then uh, the last year, I started seeing demons. They come in my room. I mean, I wasn't hallucinating. Like, they would come in my room and knock pictures off the wall and turn the lights on and off. Kathy could tell you the whole thing. I mean, it actually happened. I wasn't hallucinating or schizophrenic. Anyway, we went through, uh, but here's the point. When uh, a year into my nervous breakdown, I was, I was managing an, uh, a repair shop and I said to Kathy, I got to get out of here so I can get well. Where shall we move? Well, when we were kids, before we got married, we, we, Kathy was like, man, I want to live like Little House on the Prairie. You know, like we were in the city and she wanted horses. And, and I was like, I just want to go someplace where the birds fly really slow <laughs> and where there's no traffic. And so, this, so we're in the middle of this terrible year, right? A year, not the year we got married, but a year, about a year and a half later. And I said, uh, why don't we move to Weaverville or Lewiston? Like, why don't we just move? Because I'm getting worse. So we just literally put our house up for sale. I went in, I gave my boss my notice. I put my house up for sale. We put our house up for sale. It sold three times the first day for more than we put it up for. And, uh, and then I went in, I gave my notice to my boss first, and then we put the house up for sale. The next day I go in, and my boss says, I'm, uh, I'm, closed, I'm selling this business, and I'm moving to Weaverville with you. So he moved with us, opened another shop. I went to work for him again. Ultimately worked for him for seven years. But I'm telling you the whole story because we, we moved to a little town called Lewiston, by the way, I bought a house. Kathy didn't even see it. There was no cell phones. So I went to look for a house and bought it and then said, hey, I bought us a house. <laughs> yeah, that didn't go so well. <laughs> and so we moved to the, a little town of 900 people and then a year and a half a year later moved to uh, Weaverville, which is about 3,000 people. Um, anyway, the reason I tell you that story is because a year after we moved there, we, we started going to this little uh, church of 40 people called, uh, it was Assembly of God Church, and it was like a holy roller church. Do you know what I mean? Holy roller? Like, it didn't have the title holy roller. It was a holy roller church where, you know, people just, you know, shouted in tongues. It was like totally crazy. But, but uh, my, my spiritual father invited me there, so that's where we went to church. And we were there a year, and one Sunday, we, get, we're, we come to church, and there's a, a hippie preaching. 
and, he, and he, he's introduced with his flower child wife, and that was Bill and Benny Johnson. And Bill got up and preached, and Bill was, I mean, I guess he was Pentecostal, but he wasn't like that kind of Pentecostal. And uh, he was the first preacher in that church that didn't shout. He just talked. I can still tell you, and I was, in the, I, know, I was in the last year and a half of my nervous breakdown, and I cried through Bill's entire first uh, sermon. And uh, I went home that day, and I said to Kathy, I love that man. I don't know who this man is, but I, I love this man. Within a month, we were best friends. And um, we were together five days out of seven. We lived with him for six months. Um, and, and what I'm getting at is that if I hadn't had a nervous breakdown, I wouldn't have moved to Lewiston. If I didn't move to Lewiston, I wouldn't have met Bill. If I didn't meet Bill, I wouldn't be here. I'd still be fixing cars. My thing was a nervous breakdown, but God made my thing work together for good for me. He makes all things work together for good. He took my crap and he used it to fertilize my destiny. He took my ashes and he made it beautiful. That's a crazy story. We went into business because God gave me five prophecies in one week that I was going to go into business. And then Charlie Harper, if you know Charlie, he's on our staff. Charlie Harper had a dream that I owned this 76 station. And I said, I don't want to be in business. I want to be in the ministry. This is a true story. So I had four prophecies in a week. And then Charlie had a dream. I had four prophecies in a week about going into business. I didn't want to go into business and then uh and then Charlie had a dream he was taking me to work one day because I was working on my own car in my shop and so he said I'll take you to work so he took me to work we passed the 76 station and he said I had a dream last night that you own the 76 station by the way Charlie to this day cannot remember that dream and I said to Charlie I don't want to I don't want to be in business he said well I'm just telling you I had this dream it was on Friday that he drove me there. The reason I know that is because I got to work and two hours later, the guy who owned the 76 station, who I had never met, called me, who isn't a Christian, and said, I'm selling my station and I believe you're supposed to buy it. <laughs> and I said to him, I, I wanted to say, hey, I don't wanna be in business, but then I thought, I might die. Like, <laughs> starting to feel like Jonah here. So I met the next day, uh, we met for breakfast, and Kathy's like, oh, this is amazing, da, 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 you need to do this. I'm like, no, I don't need to do this. I want to be in the ministry. So anyway, she talked me into going to breakfast with the guy. I went to the breakfast. It was going to be $47,000 to buy the business, which I had no money. And then he said, well, I'll carry it if you put down $9,000. And I was really excited because I didn't have $9,000, and I didn't want to be in business. I wanted to be in the ministry. I go home. Kathy's like, what? You know, she was all, what, what happened? What did he say? I said, well, it's going to be $47,000 and he wants 9,000 down. And Kathy goes, you should call your grandmother. She'll give you the money. I said, my grandmother, my grandma, I love my grandmother. She's in heaven now watching the sermon. <laughs> my grandmother is known for frugalness, not generosity. So I call my grandmother, and I, of course, didn't tell her. She, at the time, wasn't a Christian, so I didn't tell her anything about God. I just said, hey, I have an opportunity to buy the station. By the way, my grandfather, her husband, owned the first service station in the Bay Area. It was called the Flying A Station. So I told my grandmother about this opportunity, and I said, I need to borrow $9,000. And she said, well, I'll call you back. And so the next day, she called back, and she said, hey, I... I can't lend you $9,000. I said, okay, no problem. You know, I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to be in the ministry. She said, but I'll give it to you. 
I'll give it to you, but you just can't tell the other grandkids. <laughs> they all know now. <laughs> so she gave me $9,000. I went in and told my boss that I was working for, I was working in a tire shop with Danny Silk. That's a whole nother story. I was working, for da working with Danny Silk. Danny was 16 at the time, and he did absolutely not know God. Let me just say this, absolutely did not know God. I witnessed to him every day. He was a drug addict and sold drugs and he absolutely drove him crazy. I went in and told my boss that I was gonna buy the station and I would give him a two months notice and he fired me on the spot. Best thing that could ever happen to me is I went back and told the guy I was buying the station from that I, that I got fired. I'd never been fired in my life. And he said, well, why don't you just take the station now? And we'll have a 30-day escrow, and you just pay me at the end of the escrow, and you can run it right now. So I ran the station under his name. I'm telling you all these details for a reason. I ran the station under his name for 30 days, and, and um, we had to put 9000 down, right? Well, I used $1,300 of the 9000 to run the business because we had no money. And I figured I'd just make it back in 30 days, but I couldn't. So on the 27th day, he said, you got to put the money in escrow. And then the 28th day, you need to put the money in escrow. And every day, I'm like, yeah, yeah, no problem. 28th day, 29th day. On the 30th day, he came early in the morning. He said, you have to put the 9,000 in the escrow so it can close today. I said, yeah, no problem. And I went in the back room, I laid on the floor and cried and said, you got me in this mess. I want to be in the ministry. <laughs> An hour later, a man that I know that ran um, a store in town came uh, and I was underneath a, a truck fixing this truck and he came over and he, uh, he handed me some money. And I was like, I, I was underneath on a creeper. I said, oh, thank you. And I put it in my pocket thinking he was paying for gas, you know, in those days. We had self-serve and full-serve. And I thought he handed me, you know, money for gas. I said, thank you all. He said, you should look at it. So I pulled out of my pocket and it was 13 $100 bills. <laughs> Nobody knew that we were $1,300 short. Nobody. But Kathy and I, my men didn't know. It was 13 $100 bills. I said, where did you get this money? He said, a man came in my store he said, two years ago, you, he was homeless, and you fixed his car, and he is prospering now, and he has a house, and he mortgaged his house to get you the $1,300. I said, what, why did he give me $1,300? He said, I don't know. He had a dream that he used to give you $1,300. <laughs> gave me $1,300, and we closed the escrow. One of the prophetic words I got in the five days was from a friend of mine. He was a prophet. His name is Danny. And he said, the Lord says, and if you open a business, he's going to bless you. I said, well, you tell the Lord, I'm not going to open a business because I'm going to be in the ministry. And seven days later, I was in business. We were in business for 20 years. And we came here, after we came here, we sold our business and we moved here. That's another story, but we moved here from, God sent us here, supernaturally sent us here. And we moved here and we sold our businesses. By, by that time we had four, three auto parts stores and a, uh, a, and, and a remanufacturing plant, and we sold them to our supplier. And the escrow was supposed to be 30 days, no, 90 days, and it turned into 18 months. And we got here, and they were still in escrow. And we moved here, and we were supposed to have a quarter of a million dollars. And my guys, my, I had uh, three managers managing three stores, and one day my manager calls me after we've been here 30 days, and he said, um, hey, boss, I just called for auto part and the numbers disconnected. Anyway, the short story is that the half a billion dollar business that bought us went bankrupt. 
didn't tell anybody, just closed their doors. So we came here, and instead of having $250,000 to live on, we owed $1.8 million. All things work together for good. (laughs) I'm like, how does this work for good? So I went and told Bill that we were quitting because we owed 127 suppliers, $1.8 million. And we were not, and by the way, we weren't getting paid. The first year we agreed to work for free. And then the second year, Kathy made $1,000 a month and I made 1000 That's our big prosperity. If you go in business, I'm going to bless you. <laughs> we never made money in business. When we sold our business, we thought we were going to make a quarter of a million dollars. Instead, we owed $1.8 million. And so we w- went into the elders and said, we're quitting. We're going back to work because we have no money. And, we, and by the way, we lost our house. We lost everything but our two cars and our furniture. One of the elders stood up and said, would you not go bankrupt for six months? Would you? And uh, I believe God's going to do a miracle. I said, well, I have no faith for that. He said, will you trust my faith? And I said, I'll give you six months. And so I left that day, went home. Kathy said, what did the elders say? I said, they said, will we trust their faith for six months? Would we not bankrupt? She said, what'd you say? I said, I guess so. <laughs> a month later, we got forgiven 900000 of the $1.8 million. And three months later, we got forgiven another 300000 And within three years, every single penny was paid off or forgiven. Never bankrupted. And then God began to teach us how to prosper. And God took the years of we were of faithfulness. We always tithed. We always gave 20% of our income to the Lord, even when we were in trouble financially. And the Lord said, I'm going to return this to you a thousand times. For 22 years, all it was is tough financial times. And the 23rd year, I wrote a book became a bestseller. I made $200,000 that year. More money than I'd made in three years in any business we owned. I wrote another book. Pretty soon the Lord blessed our writing. I'd never written anything in my life that anyone wanted to read. <laughs> a lady came in the back of the church. I was here one year came to the back of the church after a a Sunday night service, and she said, I have a word for you, and she was shaking. I said, okay, she said, I'm I'm nervous about giving it. Lady, just give it to me, I'm just a person. She said, all right, here it is. The Lord's gonna give you the mantle of C.S. Lewis, and you're gonna write books, and people are gonna read them. I said, well, that would be a miracle, because I can't spell, and I can't type, and I don't write. She said, well, I'm sorry. I said, no, no. I said, I just said it would be a miracle. And I wrote a book and it was a miracle. And and my book sold and that was a bigger miracle. (laughs) And the Lord just began to prosper us. And what I'm getting at is that we learn things in poverty that helped us navigate prosperity. Do you know what I'm saying? And you, you might be sitting here. I'm sorry, I'm totally off message. I don't even know what I'm preaching on. I just feel like to tell you these stories, I've told these stories hundreds of times, but I just felt to tell you the story. I don't know where you're at, but you know, um, sometimes you give and you're like, I'm gonna give and it's gonna, and I'm gonna prosper. And I'm like, yeah, but remember that you're always eating last year's seed. And sometimes you give and you're planting, you know, some... <laughs> Sometimes you're planting corn and sometimes you're planting apple trees. When my grandfather was a farmer, I'm just telling stories, sorry. My grandfather was a farmer. When I was 15, he farmed, um, he was farming peaches. And when I was 15, we tore all the peach trees out because peaches were, um, uh, none of the canneries wanted to buy peaches. They were really low priced, nobody wanted them. 
And so my grandfather tore all the peaches out of his entire orchard, and we planted walnuts. I was a kid. I was 15. I didn't know what we were doing. I just helped my grandfather. He lived on the farm in the, in the summers. So one summer, we plant, tore out all these trees, and we planted walnuts the next year. Well, I understand that those walnut trees did not produce fruit for the next five years. None. I mean, not worth picking. And then, you know, and then it was five years later that we actually started picking walnuts. And I was 20 years old and we would, all my family would go during harvest time for two weeks and we would all pick walnuts. What I'm pointing out is that in the agricultural age, people understood that sometimes you're planting tomatoes and, you know, I don't know what, two months later you get tomatoes or three or whatever it is. But when you're planting walnut trees, and by the way, these walnut trees were already two years old. You know, they weren't nothing. He didn't plant a seed. It was, it, that would have probably been, I don't know, seven years or something. But when you're planting walnut trees, you don't get walnuts for seven years. <laughs> and, you know, you don't walk out there and go, man, serve the Lord and nothing happened. Or look at this tree. It's, all it's got is leaves. This stupid tree. No, you realize that you planted something that's going to last generations. But it's going to be, you know, half of a decade before you reap any reward from that tree. I I just love that my, I, I didn't understand it at the time. I didn't understand that my grandfather had a vision. He understood that even though the low the peach price was low, that the walnut price would be zero for five years, but he planted for a future. And what I'm getting at is that oftentimes we do something today and we're like, it didn't work. I have students like, it's funny. You know, we live in an instant gratification generation. You, you know, when you go to a fast food restaurant, you don't get your food in seven minutes. You're like, this is fast food. What the heck? <laughs> right? Do you know what I mean? You get in line at Burger King, it, like, it took me seven minutes to get to the counter and it took him four minutes to get my burger. And you're mad. I don't know if you know where I'm going. I'm just saying it creates something in us that, the, that isn't kingdom. And that is we just want it now. We want it our way, you know, and, and the advertisements us all, we do it your way. And then when you get there, they don't. I'm like, I'd like to have lobster and a steak. And they're like, we only have burgers here. Oh, I thought you did it my way. This is my way. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, you know, probably, I'm 67. I grew up in a house. I, I, I did it. There was no such thing as fast food till I was in my teen years. I'd never ate in a restaurant till I was 15. I mean, you know, my, grandma, my grandmother cooked. And it's like, hey, grandma, what's for dinner? We're having chicken. Oh, I don't like chicken. Okay, well, tomorrow we're having roast. So you can wait till tomorrow and eat. Or you can eat chicken. I'm hungry. Uh, You got two hours. I'll have it done in two hours. Like, there's no thinking fast food. And we don't do it your way. (laughs) I'm trying to say that culture has created an unreasonable idea of how God answers prayer and how we live in the kingdom. And we have this idea that I'm gonna I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give some money away. Didn't work. (laughs) I'm like, you're planting for a generation. It isn't just all about you. It's about our Father. Give us us daily bread. Sometimes you're planting for the next generation. Sometimes you're like my grandfather, and you got to have a five, seven, ten-year vision. You got to be right now. Peaches are better than having walnuts that are nothing. But my grandfather was like, yes, but five years from now, we're going to have a rich crop that's going to pay a lot of money. But right now, we have to take care of it and fertilize it. Are you with me? I'm saying all things work together for good. You just got to give it some time. We don't even know anything about perseverance anymore. Students come up, and our our teams could tell you, because they're they're more in their life than I am. They'll come up and like, "I've I've been praying for God to give me a man. Well, if you're a woman, God said, be fishers of men. 
scriptural. It's in the Bible. It's a problem. It's right there in the Bible. Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. How long have you been praying? Three months. Fasted twice. Seriously. People graduate from school, they're like, when am I going to preach on Sunday night? They're mad because you know, I got invited to a church of, two, of, of, of 200 people. I, I want to work in a big church. Well, goody, goody for you. I'm, I'm just pointing out, like, it's, it's it, it, there's, you know, we believe in miracles, but one of them isn't that, <laughs> that it, everything's going to be instant for you. Or for me, or for any of us. I'm just pointing out that these are the years, you know, David was anointed king. It was 17 years before he became king. You know why? They had a king. <laughs> uh, excuse me, I've been anointed king. <laughs> this, is, this is how people think now. I'm 15, I've been anointed king. <laughs> I got no freaking experience, but I should be king. You know how David learned to be king? By running from a king for 17 years. Guy wanted to kill him. God's like, I'm going to put you through school first. <laughs> I'm just saying, you got to understand that God, he don't think like you. You know, Jesus said, I'll be right back. It's been like, what, 2,000 years. I'll be back. I mean, I mean, listen, the apostles had it down, like, you know, read Peter and, right? And Paul and Thessalonians, like, and it's going to be any minute now. <laughs> okay, it wasn't. How about now? I mean, I got saved in the Jesus movement. I read the late great planet Earth. And they had predictions of when Jesus was going to return in that book. And every time they reprinted it, they changed the prediction. <laughs> Just have this thing. It's got to be now. And how many understand, you know, if you're a billionaire, if you were a billionaire, you may know this, but if you're a billionaire, if you were a billionaire, and you gave away a million dollars, do you know that would be like being a person who made $100,000 give away $500? Like, like, it's all on scale. So think about this. God was never born. He lives in eternity. So when God says, I'll be right back, and you're like, it's been 2,000 years. But when you're God, he's been around forever, and a billion years is like, right away. <laughs> yes, anyway, you gotta just... I'm sorry, I'm just pointing out that God, when God rushes... It just doesn't feel like it on this side. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And you think, well, if God's in it, it's going to work out perfectly. It don't. I mean, do you know why Jesus was born in a barn? No, a barn. He was born in a barn, by the way. It was a barn. A manger is the barn. It's just a beautiful name for it. Jesus was born in a manger. It's a bunch of crap. A bunch of crap. We have horses, I can tell you. Do you know why he was born in a manger? Because they went to Jerusalem for the senses and they forgot to get a hotel reservation. And Jesus was crucified from the foundation of the world and God forgot to get a hotel for him. I mean, you would think... That if you plan for Jesus to be born at the exact time, it would go perfectly. And at least there'd be like a cancellation where you could get in. I'm just pointing out that some of you are in, 
you thought you were following God and then it just didn't go perfect. And you're like, it just didn't go perfect. I thought I was gonna be God. It's probably not perfect because it is God. <laughs> okay. Joseph in the Old Testament had a dream that he was gonna be a ruler. You know this story? It was a fulfillment of a promise to Abraham that he was gonna be a father of many nations. Do you remember this? He said, God said to him, no longer, am I boring you? No. God said to Abram, Abr Abram, no longer shall your name be Abram, your name shall be Abraham, for you shall be the father of many nations. And then he said, that three verses later, no longer shall you call your wife Sarai, but she shall be called Sarah, for she shall be a mother to many nations. That was the promise. You know what the problem was? Couldn't have kids. <laughs> have you ever noticed that oftentimes your situation is opposite your prophecies? God's like, you're gonna be a father of nations. Awesome, come on, Sarah, let's do this. <laughs> let's pursue some children. Can't get pregnant. Are you following me at all? I'm not even talking about Sarah, I'm talking about you. And do you know that Sarah got pregnant after menopause? <laughs> do I need to explain the biology to you? Like, <laughs> like it's not possible. She got pregnant after menopause. She was 91. Yeah, and she was so good looking and 91 that Abraham had to lie about him being her sister so that the kings wouldn't steal his wife when she was in her 90s. That's a hot chick. <laughs> Let me say this, Abraham didn't have any kids, but he had a hot woman, I'll tell you that. I mean, beautiful, you know, I'm not saying it's something inappropriate. And God said, you're gonna be the father of many nations. He finally has, you know, Isaac, right? Isaac has Jacob. They're still not father in any nations. Jacob has 12 sons. The 11th one is Joseph. Joseph had a dream, right? He's gonna be the leader. He's gonna be a leader, and all his brothers are gonna serve him. His father sees the anointing on Joseph and gives him a multicolored coat. You're not even getting this. He gives Joseph a multicolored coat. His brothers are jealous of him because Joseph has the mantle on him, but he's arrogant. Think about that for a minute. I mean, Joseph has the mantle and he's gifted, but he's arrogant. So God goes, I know what path you need. His brothers are already jealous of him. He has a dream and he comes out and tells his brothers about the dream. I mean, stupid is as stupid does. And his brothers, and his father gives him a multicolored coat, right? It's a big deal because it's written about several times. His brothers throw him in a pit, then sell him. They sell him into slavery, and they take his multicolored coat, and they kill an animal and put blood on it so that their father will think that he was killed by an animal. But what they didn't realize is they took the multicolored coat and put blood on it because the multicolored coat was a prophetic declaration of Abraham's anointing for fathering nations, every color, every, you get it? And they put blood on it because it was a redemptive power of God that was gonna bring it about. Joseph goes to prison, goes to slave, gets, he becomes a slave, but it says this, this is a weird, st weird statement. And, but Joseph was, a, he's a slave. Joseph was a successful man. I'd like to propose that God doesn't measure success the same way we do. And then Potiphar, Joseph's wife's, I'm sorry, Joseph's leader's wife tries to seduce him. He runs away because he's faithful. She yells rape. He ends up in prison. Follow me, all things. All things work together for good. 
it looks like Joe's going the wrong direction from his prophecy. But guess who ends up in the prison? It's the king's prison because Potiphar is the king's servant. Are you with me? It's a, it's a, it's a, blue, it's a white collar prison. And the king throws his, two of his guys in prison and they meet Joe. Are you with me? And they both have dreams. And what, what is Joe good at besides making his brothers mad? He can interpret dreams. And they just happen to have dreams in the same prison he's in. Are you with me at all? And Joe interprets their dreams accurately. One guy dies, just as Joe said. The other guy gets promoted back to the king and totally forgets about Joseph. Because Joseph goes, I'm going to interpret this dream, but you're going to tell the king, I'm in here. But he does it. Then the king has a dream. And the king, the fat calves, the skinny calves and rolls. And he, he's like, he knows. Is this boring? The king knows. This is really weird. The king has a dream. The king knows that the dream is divine, even though he doesn't believe in Yahweh. He doesn't know what the dream means, but he knows that it has something to do with the destiny of his nation. So he's troubled. Is this weird? And he starts telling all of his guys, I had this dream, man, I don't know. I gotta find someone who knows about this dream. And he's so troubled over a dream because he can't figure out what it means, but he knows it's divine. And finally, the cupbearer goes, hey, dreams, dreams. I know somebody, let's see, where was this? Oh, prison. I know this guy that does dreams. Yeah. And they call Joe to interpret the king's dream. All things, everybody say, all things. All things work together for good. Say that. All things work together for good. They call Joe, who happens to be in the same prison as the king's cupbearer, and he's there because he supposedly raped Potiphar's wife, which he didn't do. But the way he gets there is because he's so freaking arrogant that his brothers can't even stand him. So they sell him. And it looks like everything's going wrong, but it's actually going right. If his brothers didn't hate him, he wouldn't be in slavery. And if he wasn't in slavery, he wouldn't be in prison. And if he wasn't in prison, he wouldn't have met the cupbearer, interpret the dream. And if he wouldn't interpret the cupbearer's dreams, he wouldn't have got a chance to interpret the king's dream. And if he didn't interpret the king's dream, he wouldn't be a father of a nation. Sometimes you think you're losing, but you're freaking winning. And in the 38th chapter of Genesis, Joseph's family comes in. You know, there's a whole other story. And Joseph says, listen, we're only in the second year of the drought, famine. Come in and listen to this. He says, for I have become a father to Pharaoh. What was the prophetic word to Abraham? You shall be a father to many nations. How many of you know Joseph was the first fulfillment with his multicolored coat covered in blood to be a father to a nation that was a Gentile nation? And how did he get there? Through the back door. You're like, the Lord gives you words and the word, is, the word is north, and the next thing that happens is south. And you're like, I don't believe the prophetic words, I don't understand, da, da, da. Oh, that prophets, they're all false, they're all false. I don't even believe in prophecy anymore. I don't know, I don't know. All I'm doing is wandering in the wilderness, and he thought oh, I was gonna be great, and I'm not even great, I'm, I'm down here in the prison, and obviously he said me raped her, I didn't even touch her, I don't, I, I've been faithful for this. Then, uh, now I'm in prison, and, and God says, oh, you're, you're a successful man. Well, I don't feel like a successful man. I'll tell you that right now. I'm over here in prison and, and, uh, and all I'm doing is interpreting dreams for people who can't freaking remember. I interpret their dreams and here I am. 
Joe, yes, King wants to talk to you. He's had a dream. Ah, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? <laughs> what? What'd you say? It says this, that Joseph shaved and changed his clothes. How many of you know sometimes you have to dress for the season you're not yet in? Some of you need to shave and change your clothes for a season you're not yet in. Are you with me? I wasn't talking to the ladies, I'm sorry. Some of the ladies are like, I'm keeping this, They're like whatever. <laughs> do it however you wanna do it, it's a metaphor. It's like, it's a metaphor. I'm on vacation, I would prefer deodorant. However you do it, just do that. Uh-huh, <laughs> thing says I'm seven minutes past my time. Do you work for me or do I work for you? I don't even know anymore. I'm, I haven't, I'm, I'm not on any page on my notes and I have prepared 13 pages. So now let's do this message. Listen, complete spontaneous message. I don't know what you're in the middle of, but I know this one thing. All things work together for good. All things work together for good. Well, what if I die? You'll go to heaven. <laughs> well, I don't want to die. You're going to die. <laughs> Let me just be clear. You're going to die. The question is, are you really going to live? That's the question. That's the question. Because you know what's worse than dying? Doing nothing with the life you have. Because you're gonna die. If I said, everybody stand up who's terminal, everybody should stand up, you all terminal. Because the only way you get to the next level is to be a seed in the ground. You're gonna be a seed in the ground, I'm gonna be a seed in the ground, and this body is gonna give over to a glorious body. I mean, I already have one. <laughs> I mean, how much better can it get? That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Say that with true humility. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Oh, my wife's texting me, honey, you're, it's, it's over. I, all right. I'm joking, she didn't text me. <laughs> the Lord does not measure success the way we measure success. He could give a rip how many Facebook followers you have, Twitter, TikTok, Talk Talk, Truth Talk, Instagram, Instagram, Insta anything. There is no such thing as an Instagram. And by the way, all those happy pictures your friends put on there, do you know how many shots they took before they put that one on Facebook? Instagram, you're like, oh, they all have happy families and I have this kid. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about, right? You're like, how come they have, how come they're all cute? Because they worked on it for two hours, making those kids smile for five seconds snapshot. Nobody takes a, like, okay, let's take a horrible picture. Oh, you look terrible. That'll good, good on Instagram. <laughs> Nobody takes their worst moment and it creates an unreal sense of failure. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. I, I need to get some advertising here and I get some more people on my Instagram so I could <laughs> impress God. <laughs> you spend an hour in the mirror and I don't even notice. How's my hair look? It's the same way it looked when you woke up. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> I'm just trying to be a little funny to say, the things that are meaningful in life, 
things that really matter to God don't matter to society. And the things that really matter to society, I mean, just think about it. What's the highest paying jobs in the world? Catching a football. Wow. And we have 24-hour talk radio and talk shows to talk about how he did or didn't catch it. And guess who watches it? Dumbo here. (laughs) These are not things God cares about. He doesn't have a high value system for entertaining you or me. Okay, I need to just crash this plane. I just have a lot more to say, but I'm gonna be done. If you watch, listen, you you might think your life sucks because you're watching all these other people with their stucky life, but they fix it on social pages and it makes you feel like you're not winning. And I'm like, if you're faithful, and you're doing what God told you to, and you might be in the prison season while someone else is in their palace season. Celebrate their palace season because yours is coming. Are you with me? You might be Abraham and Sarah, and you're like, God promises children, and it's like, you're not even 90 yet. Your day's coming, like, just hang on, just keep trying. Work on it. I'm just pointing out that sometimes between the promise and the palace is the process. And that process is often different than you think it's going to be. The students ask all the time, did you know that you'd be one of the leaders of a movement? (laughs) I I have to keep from laughing. I was building an automotive chain It's a chain smoker. <laughs> I didn't even want to be, I mean, I, like, I am unqualified. You could tell how unqualified I am. <laughs> I'm not even on one page of these notes tonight. And I did something spontaneous instead of do notes that are, make sense. And you were here watching me. <laughs> if you're being faithful, to what you think God told you. But what if it's wrong? God still rewards faithfulness. If you're faithful to what you think God told you with your whole heart, remember that this is an ecosystem. Joseph, David wrote, the word of the Lord tested Joseph. He wrote this in the Psalms. The word of the Lord tested Joseph until his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested Joseph till his word came to pass. I'd propose that if Joseph hadn't been through all of that, he couldn't have stayed in the palace. Because sometimes we get around the process through being impatient, and we get to the palace just as God said, but two years later, we're out because we didn't do it his way. Satan offered Jesus in Luke 4, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world for they have been given to me. How many know that's what God was giving him, all the kingdoms of the world? He could have got it three years earlier if he would have worshiped Satan. Instead, he had to do it through crucifixion. How many know you can't just get there? You have to get there the right way. You can't bully your way into your promise. Joseph tried that. I'd propose. I would propose that Joseph didn't need to go to prison. Joseph didn't need to be sold into slavery. His attitude determined his process. His arrogance created a process that God had no choice but to take him low 
because he felt like he was so high. And God said, you're the right guy, but you got the wrong attitude, boy. And God knows how to take care of a wrong attitude. After 67 years, I can tell you, the woodshed's not fun. And anybody in here that's older than about 30 knows that. That there are ways. God's like, you're the right guy. You're the right woman. But God has a way to making sure you have the right attitude when you get the right job. Would you stand? I'm going to pray for you. Can you put your hand on your heart, please? I want you to say this out loud, but, but, but listen, listen, here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you just to say it. I want you to close your eyes for a minute. And here's, I'm going to have you say this. I don't want you to say it right now. All things work together for good, okay? But what I want you to do, and we're going to take about two minutes for this, which is going to feel like a long time. I want you to close your eyes and think about where you are and think about where the Lord has told you you're going. Now, you may not have a specific, like, I'm going to be a ruler or I'm going to be, but you have something in your heart that looks like success. God, that's what you told me. I want you to imagine yourself there. Okay? Now, I know you're going through, you're going through a challenge, you're going through a struggle, you're a distance from it, but I want you to imagine yourself, and I'll use it as a metaphor, in Joseph's position as ruler. And then... And, and I want you to imagine it right now. Do that right now. Just take your, it may, maybe it's your family's estranged or God told you you were going to be prospering in some area and it's actually, you can't have children. <laughs> you're going to be a father of a nation, but you just can't have any kids. You know, it's just like your circumstances are polar opposite of what God said. But I want you to imagine it as if it's not that way. Are you with me so far? Now, I want you to keep your eyes closed and I want you to say, I want you to look at the circumstances you're in and say, all things things work together for good for for those who love God God. and are called called to his purposes. purposes. And I want you to say this, I I love God God. and I'm called to his purposes. purposes. So I apprehend right now this this promise that God will take my problem and he'll make it a promise in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening.